Banner, I, th I see you online. All right. All right. We're going to get started. We don't have a very full agenda, so I don't think we'll take the full time, but let's get going. Um, this is Privacy Pass. And uh, I'm sure you all have seen the note well about uh, your requirements for participating in the IETF process. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but we want to do that and we wanna treat each other with uh, respect and uh, have good technical discussion. Um, again, please make sure if you're in the room, you sign in with either the full, full tool and disable your audio and all that good things, or uh, it's better to use the uh, on-site tool. Thank you. Um, you probably already know this information, so I'm gonna skip it. Okay, on our agenda, we have a note taker. Um, then we have uh, some core draft status uh, presentation on rate limit tokens, key consistency, and then some additional discussion on metadata and the like. Um, does anybody have anything else that they would like to add or subtract maybe from the agenda? All right. Uh, ben, would you like to give core status update or? Sure. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, apologies if I've copy pasted any of this wrong, but I believe that we've made some really good progress on the three core drafts that we sort of started off with in this working group, uh, although they've evolved substantially since, uh, since that point. So the, the architecture draft is IESG approved. Um, it's in AD follow-up. I have to admit that I'm not sure what AD follow-up uh, means here, but uh, but that is is through the ISG, so uh, that's great news. We, you may recall, we recently ran a repeat working group last call for the auth scheme draft um, that has concluded, and the that draft again has passed working group last call and and has passed on up to our responsible AD for further processing. And privacy pass protocol is actually with the RFC editor, um, but it's misref, it can't move forward because it has dependencies on the other two drafts. Tommy? We don't hear you, Tommy. Oh, okay. I, I was trying to find the mic. Um, Tommy Polly Apple. So for the auth scheme, I don't, maybe I missed it. I hadn't seen an email to the list on that. Do we need to, I, I don't know if our AD is in the room, but do we need to formally ask him to push buttons to get it resubmitted or what's going to happen there? So there was an, I believe there was an automatic notification to the AD when we changed the draft status. Ah. Um, Certainly, the chairs can follow up and and just confirm that there's no further action on any of these needed from the the working group or the uh, or the authors right now. Great. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if you could just write an email to the list and have it be, I say like AD, please progress or something. Just make sure he gets that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, there is, aside from the uh, rate limit tokens, I was. we also have a draft on batch tokens. I think uh, there was no update for, for this meeting, um, and the authors have asked that, I uh, think we should have a working group last call, so the chairs will be following up on that as well. Um, so now I think we are, it's probably good to go to uh, Tommy, rate limit tokens. Let me give you, uh, do you have uh, your I, device? I can, uh, yeah, I can also share the slides. Yeah, I'll 
me get you Thank there. You. Yep. Okay. Yep, no. Oh, sorry. Shouldn't have pressed that. Yes. Sure. Here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, Tommy Polly Apple um, on behalf of the various co authors on the rate limited token issuance protocol document. Um, so, as a reminder, this is uh, one of the kind of follow on other issuance protocol documents that we have adopted uh, beyond the original two uh, issuance protocols that were defined in the core specs that are now shipping off. Um, and this one is based on the publicly verifiable RSA blind signature scheme, but allows a per origin rate limiting. So we haven't had a lot of fundamental changes. I just wanted to uh, quickly recap what we have changed in the latest update. Um, the primary thing which we had talked about last time was that we needed to align with the work on consistency um, since that has been evolving as we go along. So we have now created a reference to the consistency mirror draft. And this is uh, the output of the design team that we'll talk about later on the consistency topic. I, I think um, the authors, for the rate limit draft are you know, interested in you know, what happens to that draft and is that something that we want to adopt here? I think that would you know, make sense to have a reference to something that we actually have formally part of the working group here. Um, and, and there are interesting uh, aspects to the consistency for rate limiting specifically. So in the case of a generic privacy pass token where we have essentially one issuer wide public key that's across everything. Uh, we just need to make sure that that key is consistent so that any individual user using a token is not being specifically targeted. But the rate limiting scheme involves two different keys going around. One is a key that is used for uh, encrypting the origin info, which is essentially the name of the origin. And this thing is still issuer wide and is visible very publicly already. It is uh, visible to the attester who is actually doing the counting buckets for the client. But we also have the actual token signing keys now, uh, since we don't have metadata associated with these tokens, I think there's a discussion later about metadata. Um, the way that someone verifying a token understands that this indeed followed the rate limit for a particular origin is the fact that particular origins or sets of origins going through a rate limited issuer have different keys. And so uh, a client that is checking consistency wants to check both uh, consistency for that issuer wide key as well as per origin keys. So the, we tried to come up with something. So we have put this in this current version um, essentially, the fix was to allow a consistency mirror. Uh, so yeah, I'm essentially doing double check or you know some variant of n check where I'm checking once, twice, or three times or whatever with some other resource to uh, validate this key. We, that need that uh, resource of the defined configuration for an issuer could include the list of keys that it is using for the various per origin things. Previously, this was undefined. It was left as an exercise to the implementation between the issuer and different origins that were going to try to redeem the key. Um, and so really, we've just added a, a, key, a definition for this. So this allows mirrors to check it. The downside is if you were uh, an issuer who has many different origins, you are now putting a uh, enumeration in your configuration of all the different origins. This may be large, and it also is uh, publicly revealing kind of the list of things that you're supporting rate limiting on. This may be a very good thing for transparency, uh, but it also may be something that deployments don't want to take on necessarily. So this is something I would uh, love to get feedback on. I think all the authors would like to get feedback on if, if they think it's viable or not. Um, 
I can imagine alternate approaches such as having the mirror check something against the origin. So like you, you, you could imagine um, instead of asking the issuer, hey, what are all of the different uh, per origin keys? There could be instead some defined way to ask an origin that is redeeming tokens to say, hey, for this issuer, what key are you expecting? And then you could also do that in some mirror check way and maybe that would be a, a preferred mechanism. So happy to hear thoughts if people have those either now or at the end of the slides. The one other thing we had is we also have an open issue that I think was filed by Chris uh, talking about the rate limiting context. So as I mentioned, the current rate limiting, limiting context is an origin and technically within the token challenge structure, this is an origin info. Uh, so it's it's a it's a list of things, and currently it's a list of one or more host names, and that works pretty well because that's the way we've imagined rate limiting. But uh, Chris brought up the point that for different applications, particularly maybe outside of some of the website use cases, you may want a URL path in there as for an origin. So I may have uh, like a, a PPM DAP system that wants to have rate limiting tokens. And it's all on one origin name, but it has different services under it on different URL paths. So there's really no reason that that string couldn't include more in it. I think we just need to define a new text around how open that is and how flexible that is. So again, a piece of uh, content where we would love some input and thoughts. Um, so that's all I have. So if people have thoughts or questions on that, please speak up. Otherwise, uh, find us in the GitHub. Stephen. Stephen Valdez, Google. Um, so I haven't actually looked at 18 too closely. Um, I'm uh -huh. curious if you could also go in the opposite direction where you could have multiple origins and host names covered by like one rate limiting context separate from the like issuer join. Or if there's like privacy issues there that you know. Right, that, I think that's that's another dimension in which you can, oh. oh. sorry. Well, that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> that's another dimension in which you could expand the notion of the rate limiting context. And I think it's reasonable. Um, one of the things here, which I think is good. Um, so the, the thing that you're rate limiting upon is communicated in the encrypted channel all the way to the issuer. So like to the thing that doesn't see your IP address or your identity, but knows it's the token upon which you're rate limiting. So the client is in full control over what it's revealing. So I think we would just need, you know, careful considerations. Like, I don't think you would want to automatically say like, you know, here's, I'm, here's this big combination of many host names that's revealing my personal browsing history and using that as the thing I want to relate it upon. But if there are reasonable sets such as re recapture for this website, uh, maybe that's a perfectly appropriate thing to have as a tuple that is the object of the rate limiting context. Uh, Chris Wood, yeah, this is, I mean, primarily just a deployment convenience thing. Um, rather than having to spin up separate origins uh, for these different like resources, maybe in the DAP case or whatever other application specific case, you just you could just at the application layer in the origin info and the token challenge um, specify. So I think it's probably pretty easy to spell how to do this, um, mm -hmm. uh, saying maybe maybe the origin info elements are not just origin, like the, what we currently call just origins, but maybe they're, it could be URLs or they could be whatever other else makes sense for the application. Um, and I'm happy to send a PR to do this. Um, cool, thank you. That'd be great to have a PR. Um, I'd also like to point out that this is, it's very validating of the decision we made in auth scheme to call this like origin info rather than like origin name. Like it, it gives us the flexibility <laughs> to have uh, many things. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, um, to go back to what Steven was saying, hmm. would a reasonable set be every domain on Cloudflare? They're all hosted by the same server. You might want to rate limit them together, but that's going to be millions of domains. That's an interesting question. So technically, 
there is no reason that the origin info must be the same thing that is serving the challenge. Like we can open that up to be a bit more flexible. Um, what it must correspond to is the thing that the origin sending the challenge and validating, like it, it must match up to that, right? It says like, uh, I expect this particular key. And so you could like, you could very easily have a key that is Cloudflare origin wide. And the origin info is like, we need to define, but like somehow uh, explained broadly in the challenge just so that we're like, okay, I'm just going to use this one. Um, I think the main question is like defining the client behavior of knowing if it's okay to do that, because it's very easy to say, I get a challenge from example.com and I say, okay, I allow you to uh, apply the rate limit to example.com. How does the client know that this really is a Cloudflare origin? Because generally, like, unless we're inspecting IP addresses and C name chains, we don't have a reason, maybe, or maybe like certificates or something else. Like, I think we need just some rule to create a binding there. Because the, the reason why I was thinking it would be impossible is because what would you do with multi CDN? <laughs> right? So it's in three different rate limiting domains depending on chance or what DNS return. Like, it's just going to be messy. I mean, I, I could certainly see that if, you know, like, don't rely on DNS here. But if, for example, I'm relying on a field in the certificate and it happens to have like a Cloudflare certificate at this point, then I know that this particular challenge came from an instance that was this and therefore I'm applying the Cloudflare wide rate limit and I just have a different one elsewhere. But I, I just need some way to know that on the client and validate a secure relationship. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just checking the auth scheme uh, doc. Uh, it does, it is rather opinionated about what the, the yes. element should be. In particular, it says like the name must be like authority. What does it say? The name of the origin that issued the authentication challenge is included in the list of origin names. Um, so uh, if, we, if we wanted to support that particular use case uh, and then allow us to define, you know, something later that establishes that binding between example.com and Cloudflare or whatever, we, we might need to like, rework that text just a little bit. Let me try this out. Cause I, I, I think we don't actually need to modify that text. Go for it. Because the rate limit document describes that the client needs to choose amongst the things in the list of origin info, which is the one that it will use for the rate limiting context. And so even if the auth schemes origin info list needs to contain the currently challenging origin, it can also contain a broader thing that we would just need to newly define the rules for which the client could accept that. Yeah, that would work as well. Example.com, comma, cloudflare.com, whatever. And you would say like cloudflare.com. Exactly. Yeah, like essentially like I say like, oh, star.cloudflare. And like, because that is in my certificate, I prefer the broader one. I choose to use that. Yeah, that's fine. Jonathan, or yeah, um, every I think every Cloudflare certificate has the same C name or, or has the same CN, like Cloudflare. No, it's not. It's the it's the one that isn't the SAN. It has the same like common name. An SAN can be a list. Oh, okay. It okay. has the same common name of like. Oh, does it? <laughs> So for the proposal of having multiple things in the origin info that the origin sends, do we run into the problem with this like has multiple overlapping rate limiting contexts that now like a malicious client could ask for either and either the issuer needs to know that you should only use the like more limited version or I guess we do kind of want to be able to drop the like real origin to avoid having that as an additional context. Right. So I mean... I I think this is a problem that needs to be solved in this document. Um, and maybe there's some rule about how you know which one it is. I think what you're alluding to is correct that the issuer, because it does see this origin info, could reject ones that it doesn't expect to be used. Like it says, I want it to only do the CDN wide things. And so I will not let you do it on the uh, individual origin host names. But that means the client needs to know 
which ones are valid and not for the purposes of the issuance protocol. Um, yeah, doesn't it also feel like kind of a thing you could avoid by just don't not configuring things in a bad way? Like don't configure rate limits in a way such that you would have these conflicts? If you have to always send the origin name, like you may like, for example, you could say the the first thing in the list is the thing that you want to rate limit on. I don't I'm not understanding the problem then. Uh, I, so I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, but the problem is if the list includes example.com and Cloudflare CDN and the issuer accepts both of those as valid for the rate limiting context, then the client has like free reign to choose which of these it's going to come back with. Uh, under, essentially under the same key, I can, I now can have rate limited state for one of those two origin infos. I don't, I don't think that's possible to do because uh, in particular, the challenge has to have the issuer name, which is bound to a specific rate limit policy. So everything in that list has to have the same policy applied to it. That's just the way we've right. constructed it. Right. But since the thing that the attester does the rate limiting upon is based on like the anonymized version of the origin ID, having two valid origin infos that the issuer accepts gives me two buckets that I can be on, on the attester. So I can essentially double my rate limit. No, no, no. Uh, uh, oh, okay. That's a different problem. I thought the problem was you have example.com has rate limit X. No, no, no. It's not that there are two rate limits is that I can double bucket. I, I, I can just amplify my ability to get tokens. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess, uh, don't do that. I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of this comes down to like finding a reasonable heuristic, so like to make sure that the client and the issuer do exactly one thing, and the issuer can make sure you don't do the thing they don't want you to do. Yeah. Okay. That seems yeah. like it, it's all solvable. Yes. Okay. We just need to write it down. Hey, Nick Sullivan. Um, I did not read this issue, so I apologize. But um, how okay. explicit are you planning on being uh, in the document for defining what these uh, these particular buckets are. Uh, so like you have a host name, that's a well-defined thing. Are you, are you going to define a set of schemes in front of it? Like host name colon host name versus URL colon something versus SNI matching colon some bucket. Uh, how explicit do you want to be here and how are the client and server supposed to agree? Exactly. So I, I think that's the main open issue in question here. Uh, Chris offered to propose text. So I'm excited to see what that will be. But I'm not sure yet. Okay, thanks. So feedback, absolutely welcome. Okay, I think that drains the queue. And I think we're good on time though. So yeah, I think uh, any other. Uh... Oh, Chris. Uh oh. Sorry. No. Can we go back to the other issue? Uh, yeah. No one commented on this one. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't really like this in particular, like the enumeration of the origins. Um, it would be fantastic yeah. if we could avoid it. Um, you like this? Uh, I, I was going to suggest like uh, perhaps changing the underlying client signature scheme to something that is partially blind to solve not only this problem, but then also the origin token binding problem that we have, that we worked around by having per origin keys in the first place. Um, that would uh, vastly simplify the consistency issue because then you really only have two keys, like the encapsulation key and the one true token key. Yep. Um, but I recognize it's a pretty big shift and that document is not even adopted by CFRG or anything yet. So um, I, I'm curious to hear what people think about that. Um, I know there are yeah. already implementations of this. Um, and, and I think that does get us back into the metadata question, although potentially in this context, it is easier to limit because the client knows exactly what metadata to expect. Uh, well, I mean, the only thing you'd be shoving into the metadata would be the origin name or whatever. Yeah, like the exact same thing that you encrypted. Exactly. Yeah. A and just remind me because I, I don't know the details of the cryptography here for the partially blind case. Uh, that, that information that's partially blind would not be visible to... Correct. The attester as Correct. it transits. Yeah, it's only after unblinding that it becomes visible. Well, you would still encrypt it and send it to the issuer. Um, the issuer, like the signature that it pops out the other end, would basically be bound to that that 
that value, so the origin name in this case. Okay. Um, but like, I still see. be encrypted in transit across the attester. Okay. Um, I'm I, I'm I'm fine with that direction. Um, if if. I, but I think that's something that we need to bring up working group consensus on as the direction. For sure. Um, uh, it's unfortunate that like it, th there's a lot of issues that are conflated here by the, the underlying choice in, in crypto. But um, yeah. if we're willing to be flexible there, I think yeah. we could simplify things quite a bit. That's great. That's great. Um, from an implementer's perspective, um, I guess I'm still... Like the the partially blind stuff on the server side is uh, should be manageable, like in particular because you'll know the set of metadata values that are passed in, and it's not like you don't have the same DOS risk as you would otherwise. It's not like arbitrary values being passed in. Um, uh, so I, th I think it would be fine from that perspective. I don't know if you have opinions now or if you can get opinions on, later on, like what the client side. Uh, yeah, I'd need to talk to our client side crypto team. But, yeah. Okay. So can I ask a clarifying question here? Yes, what, sir. In, in the CDN case, which is what I'm thinking about, in your alternative approach, the origin is Cloudflare? I mean, well, we don't, we don't CDN, know. Sorry. So like, whichever CDN is hosting right. it. Um, it's not always Cloudflare, John. Mm, <laughs> it's, it's not <laughs> always Cloudflare. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... I mean, just to play out the example entirely, right? Like, yeah, I have example.com uses awesome captcha as its rate limiting issue or whatever. And awesome captcha has one key for all of its origin name encryption and one key that's dedicated to example.com. And you would like define some way for your mirror to ask example.com like i don't know on some like well known you're like some some mm. uri template or something to say hey example.com what key are you challenging people for when you're getting them token type 3 for awesome captcha okay so so that was that was what my what i was thinking okay yeah. In which case, isn't this turtles all the way down in that the mirror now needs to be rate limited? Or sorry, the dot well known endpoint now needs to be rate limited. Um, because otherwise, because uh, if it's, sorry, if it's not rate limited, then I can just pound that endpoint. Sure. And if it is rate but, but, limited. I mean, that should just be like answering the same key all the time. It's just like a static file, essentially. But it, right. So if it, if it is rate limited, then how do I get the token? And if it's not rate limited... How do I rate limit it? Because I can't do the token thing. I don't. I, I, I think right. You would have to say like that. Fetching that resource would not be something that you would apply this type of very because like again like this is like the strict like I want to enforce on a per client level that you can do five of these actions per day. Right. Um, generally not like I think we can just say like you must not do that for this just like generic key fetch resource. Also the mirror can do caching if it needs it. Like so yeah, it's not appropriate to do turtles all the way. I, I was I was considering the caching, but like yeah. let's say somebody has a big list of Cloudflare domains and they hit the dot well known for each of them. Yeah. You could try to the mirror it. is going to pound Cloudflare. Sure. So you, you could use that to DOS Cloudflare. Right, and then the mirror itself needs to rate limit the, but like, but the mirror doesn't know necessarily who it's talking to. Well, uh, I, 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 so again, and now this gets into the consistency discussion about mm. the design of the mirror, um, because you know the point of a lot of this is you know allow me to have better IP privacy such that you aren't rate limiting an IP address anymore yeah. when I'm going to my websites. Um, now. I think our assumption is that for things like talking to the attesters or whatever, you are willing to reveal more about yourself in order to be rate limited or identified. Um, potentially some of that comes into the mirror as well, such that like when I'm asking the mirror to essentially proxy this on my behalf, I may need to be more honest with it about who I am just for fetching these keys. 
Okay. Uh, now, this does bring up then the problem of if you do this alternative approach, now you're revealing to the mirror what you're trying to access, and now it's a locus of information. So, yes, like sidestepping this problem by going partially blind would be a great solution here, too. So, but you, 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 we're thinking on the same page. Okay, thank you. Who's after Jonathan? I think Ben. Hi, just, um, just responding to Jonathan's point specifically uh you know my understanding here is that we can't rate limit rejection right like a, a hostile client can always spam the server with with bad uh bad tokens and the server has to process them and reject them so uh so we, we don't actually have a rate limit on failure and serving the keys like these static keys is dramatically less expensive than processing a token to figure out whether it's valid or not so uh so basically there's a threshold of of cost below which rate limits uh rate limited tokens just don't apply uh and this doesn't make that any worse it's a very good point okay I think we've beaten all the horses we can beat for now. I think this is great input um, and we'll try to follow up on issues and lists. Great. Thank you. All right, Stephen. Uh... Did you show up? Did you get it? No, no. Let me do it this way, and uh, I'll do this because for some reason I don't see you. And now I'll give this to you. You should have control now. Hi, I'm Steven from Google, uh, presenting on the K-Check protocol for a bunch of folks from the key design team, Matthew, Benjamin, Chris, Scott, and Tommy. Um, so the first thing is that this document is actually different from the one linked from the slides. We didn't have consistency between those. That's the old key consistency document from like a year ago, while this is particularly the consistency mirror work. Um, so we presented about this at ITF 117. Uh, so we'll mostly be going over the changes since then and possible next steps. So the first big change is that we decided to rename this protocol because bike sheds are fun. Uh, so we're moved from K check protocol to this checking resource consistency with HTTP mirrors as this reflects the more current state of the document. Uh, the big changes were we simplified consistency checking from being uh, generalized K check, lots of possible mirrors to just being about one invocation and letting the application decide whether you use multiple mirrors and what the appropriate failure behavior there is. Uh, there was a lot of clarifications made around client behavior and what you do when you have a inconsistent response from the mirror. This really breaks down into two main cases. One is where you actually get like a different value from the mirror, which is the more critical the client needs to deal with that as a like critical error versus the you can't reach the mirror, the mirror has latency or timeout concerns, in which case, depending on the particular application, you may either want to fall back to something that's cached but not expired or wait and try refetching again later. Um, and then we added more behavior around how the validity of different responses from the mirror are used and when you're supposed to recheck behavior. Uh, one common concern that's come up is this like thundering herd problem of if everything expires at the same time and all clients hit the mirror at the same time, you may take down the mirror even if it's running across multiple servers. Uh, we still have a bunch of open work items and issues uh, that we need to resolve before we can cut this draft. Uh, the first one's a batch consistency check. There are some use cases where you may want to be requesting multiple resources at one time. Uh, for some cases, you can rely on H2H3 pooling, so you don't need any particular behavior. Other cases, you might not. I think the current plan is to leave individual applications to generate their own profile, their own definition of what the resource is, so it's still effectively one resource. Um, I think this is per application, unless there are enough use cases that come up that really need this like sort of batched handling a bunch of resources at one time. Uh, possibly, if you like, have hundreds or thousands of keys you want to get at one time or things like that. 
Um, and there's other big set of issues is there's a bunch of wording that we need to refine, things like timing attack, the thundering herd problem, what the different application policies and how you decide when to fall back or what to do when things are in weird states and how to handle multiple mirrors. Because even though this document will by itself like discuss the multiple mirror issue, we still need some amount of text so that applications can make the right decisions here. Um, yep, yeah, so not anything super complicated, hopefully easy to handle. Um, I think next steps here are either doing a call for adoption for the document. Uh, the other thing that came up at 117 is maybe having an interim, uh, but given that the document isn't all that complex, I don't know if we need that much time or if we can handle this on the mailing list and then just fixing the remaining issues and then making sure all the docs, both this one and the uh, other privacy pass docs are synchronized between them. Any questions? Um, I have a question uh, for the group. I'll do a show of hands of just how many people have uh, read the current document. I'll put that up in just a second. All right, we got, okay, we have a, a few. Uh, would be great to get a few more uh, eyes on this, um, but I think uh, I don't see a reason to block on an adoption call. So um, I think we should probably do that, but I'll confer with Ben. Oh. Any other comments? Tommy Polly. Um, more just a question of what we expect the output of the working group to be around consistency. Like we already, like there is the adopted consistency, like general document, and there's this. Um, I, I'm assuming we're expecting those to say separate, or like, do, do we want to publish both of those separately? Uh, do we want to only end up publishing something like the mirror or I guess, I mean, more for like yeah. the milestones and like what, what is the intent here um, long-term as the output? Um, I mean, I, I don't necessarily see a problem with publishing to these two things um, or we could, if, if we thought that there, that existing document is, kind of superfluous for the most part and can be merged together into one document. I think that that could also be a, um, a valid approach. Um, it's something we probably should discuss. I, I don't have a preference. I don't think there's a, a natural order here or something required from the charter. I think we can choose. Great. Um, okay. Ben, uh, did you have a, yeah, I'm curious to hear what Ben thinks too. Hi. So uh, just speaking as individual, uh, I think both of these drafts are valuable. Um, you know, we have basically an informational draft that lays out some common patterns seen in different kinds of systems for ensuring consistency across a, across a pool of clients. Uh, and then we have a, a concrete protocol that basically I, I wouldn't necessarily you know, having an, one informational and one standards track is uh, logical enough. Uh, specifically on this draft, I want to say, I, you know, thank you to the authors for all the improvements and, and work that's gone into it. I, I think it's, uh, I think I really like the mirror protocol. I wanted the mirror protocol to exist. Um, I think it is interesting to sort of think about where it should go. Um, and you know maybe maybe privacy pass is the right place, but it actually seemed like a very general utility that could be valuable for even for purposes unrelated to consistency. It really strikes me as essentially a an upgrade, a modernization of the the you know twenty five year old idea of an HTTP proxy. So uh, I definitely would want to get a lot of review on this draft from outside of privacy pass from more general HTTP experts. Uh, and also, uh, 
as I've, I've sort of uh, at this point pestered the, the authors to an extreme degree, uh, I don't think it actually substantially resolves the thundering herd problem in its current state. Um, and that may be fine. It may, maybe we may just decide that that's essentially out of scope here. But um, we do have some, some more decisions to make there. OK. Um, I mean, we, we can easily uh, ask for review from other groups. And, and that sounds like it would be the right thing to do. I don't think that would prevent us from adopting it as a work item in this group, though. Um, so that, that would be the intent, unless somebody has other ideas. Eric? Yeah, I just want to voice the opinion that I don't think Thundering Herd needs to be solved before adoption. We just need to be, we don't have, we have to not think that the current solution is completely un, uncompatible with solving Thundering Herd. If we think there's no way the solution can ever solve Thundering Herd, I think that's a barrier to adoption. But unless it's at that level of incompatibility, then I think, I don't think not solving Thundering Herd yet blocks adoption. We can adopt and get Thundering Herd solved before we publish. Yeah, I think the plan is still to continue to work on refining that, at least from the work open work items. I don't know if we can solve it 100%, and some things might be out of scope, but I think there's still work to be done. So I don't think we need to block adoption on that. Chris? Um, one of the questions was uh, to where this might be submitted, if I understood correctly. Um, other candidates being like, you know, HTTP biz, or was that? I, I don't personally know exactly where it would be submitted because I, I think that the, the other group that was concerned about key consistency was um oh hi oh, oh hi yeah and so like that 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 could be a place because they had interest i feel like if we tried to bring it to another group it's like foisting this upon them which isn't really a work item of theirs uh, and m maybe maybe that makes sense to me it doesn't but I don't know what what do you think? No, I think this is the right group because it's yeah. specifically in the charter to address this sort of problem. Um, but also, Tommy, um, with your HTTP chair hat on, would you agree with that assessment? You know, I'd want to talk to Mark a bit too. I, I I think the holistic notion of like this is the modern generation of reverse proxies is pretty big for the mirror protocol and um, maybe something like it would come about, but I, I certainly want a lot of consultation and review with HTTP BIS on the mirror protocol. I know there's already been some from the design team talking to some experts there, um, but I think trying to make it uh, its goal and uh, problem solution space too much larger will just make it everything slower and hinder it. Um, but we could have an eye towards uh, collapsing mirror protocol into something more standard. Uh, if reverse proxies do indeed get reinvented and more consistently standardized. Ori. Hi, Ori Steele. I'm, um, Sorry, I don't have a ton of context, but uh, the key consistency question, is this like detecting duplicity around like a single identity serving or a single resource server serving different identity keys to different parties <laughs> upon request? Yeah. So uh, just a quick comment that um, consistency proofs and inclusion proofs for key transparency is obviously a, a particular new working group that you know you might be interested in having a discussion around that. And I'm the new uh, key trans co-chair. We're having our first session on Friday. Happy to check more offline. I don't have enough context to be helpful here. Uh, yeah, um, my mental model is that this is like poor man's uh, transparency and we would actually use something like key tr transparency if we wanted something a bit stronger in practice. Um, and in fact, the informational draft that the working group already adopted like describes some transparency like system uh, for solving the problem if you if you can do so. So KT would be a, a, a tremendously you know, good fit for that. So
Okay. Um, all right, so now I believe we've gone through our regularly scheduled agenda. All right. And what we would like to do is uh, talk a bit more. In, in the previous meetings, we've had some discussion that I, I feel we didn't, and then Ben feels also that we didn't completely finish our discussion on um, the inclusion of metadata and what, what is acceptable and, and uh, how, how do we reason about that within a uh, privacy pass? Um, ben, do you want to talk about some of this section or? Sure. So, uh, yeah, so we spent a lot of time at 117 discussing in detail some proposals to add public metadata in general and some specific kinds of public metadata to, uh, to privacy pass tokens. And uh, there were, there was a lot of interest in this definitely a lot of people who who felt that this was useful and a good proposal but also some significant concerns uh and we didn't have a any uh, volunteers to present that topic at this session but the chairs felt that it was important to see if maybe some more conversations had happened that changed anybody's perspective there and uh take the temperature of the group on uh, what what folks would like to do in this area and with these drafts. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, for example, if uh, if you were somebody who, uh, if you've had a conversation or done some thinking about some of the privacy considerations about public metadata, especially since one seventeen. I'd love to hear your perspective and whether you think that basically we've solved that enough to be ready to move forward. Um, you know, my position is mostly as it was uh, back at 117 and in, in the discussions on the list since then, uh, there are operational, uh, there is operational value that comes from using this. Um, uh, and we believe we can like reasonably handle all the privacy potential implications um, as described in the architecture document, but then as discussed at 117 in the specific extension drafts themselves. Um, uh, there are, uh, so there, there is value here, but also uh, in the core documents, we in the registry have a slot that says like whether or not this token scheme supports like public metadata or not. And if we're not, if the group is not gonna like spend any time like working on things that provide public metadata, we should like get rid of that, that slot. Like I, like so, like I, it seems like we we said we're going to do it, but now we're like a bit hesitant about doing it. Like, I, I'm not. I, I think I wish the chairs would just please just make a decision as to whether or not we're going to do this by like perhaps issuing an adoption call for this thing because um I, like we seem kind of stuck. Nick. Uh, apologies, no video here. Um, I had concerns at the 117 meeting, and I tried to do a, a privacy review of the um, proposed uh, initial individual drafts on this topic, which I, I, I think raised those privacy concerns and um, didn't standardize the mitigations. So that... That, that was certainly a, a, a concern that I had. I, th I think we could address those mitigations in, in a standardized way so that we could have an interoperable privacy preserving uh, system, uh, even one that potentially has some uh, public metadata, um, but it wasn't initially clear to me and I haven't seen discussion on the list that confirmed that we could do that. All right. 
Tommy Polly Apple. Um, and I'd be curious to hear from Nick again uh, after what I say. So, I mean, in general, the metadata concerns are they they do make me worried in cases, but I, I think it's important to be able to have them and find a way forward. So I'd like to see us do it. Um, and I'm wondering if at least for the first cases, so we can at least make progress, we can you know scope the use of metadata to cases that we could clearly consider safe if we think we can define those. So I'll just throw out a couple things as possibilities. Um, you know, one based on what we were saying earlier for the rate limited type, if we switch to a model that was partially blind, you could have an instance where the metadata is something that is already coming in the challenge from the origin, right? So like essentially it's, it's information that the origin already has and you are just getting a token that covers that as the metadata and really it's just a, a way to not have an explosion of a number of keys and to also simplify the consistency problem. And then similarly, you could have a case where there's a piece of information that the client is already sending to the origin and it is then challenged to get a token that proves that thing. And then you just send the token that covers that. Um, so it's essentially guaranteeing that for uses of metadata in those cases, nothing new is being revealed. It is only uh, having the token, you know, essentially sign that metadata. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear from Nick or others who have concerns if such a limit to the scope would help. Yep. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't need to be the only one talking on this, I hope, um, but um, I, I think cases where, um, yeah, where, where the data is included in some other part of the request um, do, does seem like a um, promising direction. I, I think the question is just, are we, are we going to standardize that in, in some way or just, or just suggest that implementers try to address that separately? Um, ben, did you want to go? Uh, no, I, I went behind you. Oh, okay. Um, uh, to respond to Nick, I mean, the, the suggestion that Tommy have is like, uh, yeah, you, you standardize it by just only choosing to work on extensions uh, that have that particular property. And that seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. For example, the geo extension, that would not have that property. And so maybe that goes elsewhere. That's totally fine. Um, but there are, there are very reasonable extensions like expiration like that are already basically known to the issuer and um, therefore like they don't increase the privacy surface. They simply help with the uh, deployability. Uh, hi, uh, just, just as an individual, I have a question. Is it possible for at least some of these schemes to enumerate the possible metadata values in the configuration because if if i can see as a client you know this configuration contains seven different possible metadata values or for like country geo code this contains 180 possible uh you know metadata values uh, and i'm just going to pick one of them as appropriate then that's covered by the consistency procedure whatever it is for the configuration and so that that you know, lets me calculate the entropy loss. Um, I wonder if that something like that is possible. Hey, Nick Sullivan, uh, back to Chris's comment. Um, is the decision making process for which of these extensions get uh, included in the working group? Uh, it could be covered by, a, you know, a change in the charter that um, would help define which things are in scope and not in scope and help determine whether the geo extension, which is not necessarily known to 
uh, the server would be in scope or not. Is that something worth considering? Yeah, could be. Uh, uh, ben, uh, yeah, I think your consistency uh, suggestion is good. It was discussed at 117. It's like you potentially might want to enforce consistency amongst the configuration, which would include all possible extension values. So yeah, I think, you know, uh, should we choose to take on this work, uh, we would of course consider consistency uh, or, or like factor in consistency into the overall privacy story to ensure that like clients can reason about like what their like their privacy posture is and what uh, increased their uh, fingerprinting service or whatever they might have. Okay, to, to me, what it sounds like is that we, we, we probably have a way forward here, at least for some of this work, uh, by, by being able to constrain uh, <clears throat> the metadata values and per perhaps even uh, more so if, if they can be enumerated. Um, Benjamin? Yeah, Benjamin Baldush Mozilla. Um, so I wonder, like, should there be a document that sort of actually describes the guidelines for, you know, like, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable, and in case we can, some of those drafts actually go into the category, this is acceptable, we just work on it, and if it's not. It, yeah, I think it, it, perhaps a document or perhaps uh, Nick's suggestion, if it, if it doesn't have to be a, a, a lot of text, then perhaps it can be, um, you know, some criteria in the charter, um, but something that the, the group has has consensus on would be the the desire here, right? So that, you know, so yeah, I, it's documented in some way. So uh, as uh, I'll attempt to speak as chair here um, and say so that the charter says that specifically instructs us to uh, work on including it, issuer supplied metadata and including small amounts of metadata with tokens uh, as well as associated impacts on privacy. And I think that you know what we're trying to square here is is figure out if there's a path here that um that basically squares with the use of the word small and the emphasis on preserving privacy here and we want to make sure that uh that we're you know moving forward with metadata support as as the charter instructs us and also staying within those bounds Um, Tommy Polly Apple. So just to voice on like the charter question and not to disagree with you too much, Nick, but it feels like from the discussion here, we have, you know, sufficient, you know, concerns being brought up and you know, reasonableness that through the, just the process of coming to consensus around what we want to adopt and what we will progress and making sure things go through appropriate sector reviews, et cetera. I think we'll do a good job and we don't necessarily need a charter change and a process change to make sure that we have a good set of things. Um, the charter has this space. It allows us to work on it. Um, it says, you know, we need to consider the privacy goals. Uh, I, I think we can do the right thing and uh, adding more limitations to the charter, not only is process overhead and then those people in ISG and IAB have to like go approve that stuff, but we would likely, uh, encounter a situation where we'd want to uh, change those specifics again in the future if we come up with other approaches that will work. So um, I, th I think it's more just we want a careful consensus call here on what we should do. So then it kind of kind of like we don't really know that there's that this is going to be a problem of people coming and bringing all sorts of things and trying to force them through the group. And so let's not try to solve that problem if it's not a problem. Right. I think it's a problem that you know, the, the chairs can do a good job of solving by making sure that we have sufficient time and review as we consider adoption on any new extension here. Yeah. Um, also in the, the first item uh, in the extensions, Austin awesome extensions document, uh, it describes you know, like yet a new registry for all the extensions that we might potentially work on, as well as like a policy for which uh, things get added to that registry. So I think we could like be, yeah. If, if we choose to work on this, be very clear 
in the description of that policy that is what does it take to get something added to this registry um for example if it's like a privacy nightmare maybe it doesn't go into the registry but like if, if it's not maybe it does <laughs> but uh yeah I, I think you know through through like the 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 stuff that we can get consensus in the working group and the, in these core documents we can reasonably bound uh the work here without without issue like i'm, I'm not worried about that what? The, the, the challenge will be like getting consensus on what are the reasonable <laughs> extensions to work on. Like, uh, Geo one will be like particularly controversial, which is like to be expected. Uh, but there are other ones that I, I think are you know, not so problematic. Jonathan, did you? And the Geo one will be controversial. I thought everyone would agree. I'm, I'm surprised that it's controversial. The, the geo one, surely everyone agrees that's a privacy nightmare and we shouldn't do it. <laughs> All right. So I think, I think we have have a way forward we'll, we'll need to determine the exact mechanism here but i i think we, we have a couple places we could document it. it sounds like auth scheme extensions is probably a good way to go um it, but uh yeah just if i can offer a suggestion i think uh, a reasonable way forward would be to start an adoption call for the contents of the first two drafts which give us like basically the mechanism to add extensions later on and then so when yeah. that goes through and we like decide that we can have the mechanism to do extensions, then we as a group one by one go through and consider each of the different individual extension documents. Um, and that's where the popcorn and fun will come in. Uh, how about we do a show of hands for that idea? And let's see, what will we call it? So let's see. To be clear, like the first two documents are like absolutely useless without yeah. actual extensions. So like, um, like they're adopt adopting them is like predicated on the assumption that we will eventually do some extension work. <laughs> Should we run an adoption call for the first? Uh, you, you could use the Oscium extension <clears throat> one, maybe, if that's what you're talking about. I'd have to think more about it, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, like, yeah, because maybe there's other use cases, but like all this extension stuff is silliness if we never adopt an extension. Mm. That's true as well. So I'm going to say, should we adopt the first two documents as a base to establish a basis for metadata extensions? Ben? That, that sounds like an adoption call. How about should we run an, adop an adoption call? Are we ready to run an adoption call on the first two documents? OK. I had that, and then I thought it was, that's fine. Are we? Um, call on the first two. Well, while we're having this, I want to ask some of the authors. You know, we've we've had at least two different types of mitigations mentioned. One of them would be a uh, a rule to only include information that's already visible to the issue, or another would be to uh, only include metadata that's enumerated in the config. Uh, I wonder uh, where would you see one or uh, one or both of those kinds of rules appearing in this uh, in this spectrum of documents? Uh, I think they would be in the specific uh, right, right now. I'd have maybe I have to think about it a little bit more. I think they would go in the specific extension document. Um, but perhaps there's something general to be said um, in the extensions. Uh, the, the first one, 
much like we have sort of, to be frank, like sort of hand wavy guidance in the architecture document that says like, you know, don't do bad things with metadata. Um, uh, we could probably be a bit more precise um, as the as we get more concrete and closer to specific extensions. Um, I'm not sure how helpful the architecture document is on that point. Chris Patton, does any has anybody named a use case for metadata for which neither of these is true? I not either that the metadata is somehow private or like not visible already, or what was the other one? Or not enumerable? I think not enumerable is probably we probably have use cases for that is my hunch. But the first one isn't it always visible? Okay. Okay. All right, I'm starting a poll on, are we ready to run an option call on the first two documents as you can ignore that as I couldn't see it when I was typing it. All right, looks like we're uh, give people another second to figure out how to click the things on the phones. All right, so it looks like we're at uh, 19. Uh, I think we're ready to think not. Um, if anybody who's said they don't think it's ready if you want to get to the mic and let us know, that would be great. If not, then hopefully that would come out uh, if we do an adoption call. Oh, Nick. I just, um, it, it was just what I said in the chat. I don't, I don't feel strongly about this, but did we want to, you know, ha uh, try to address this question to see if we can get one of the extensions um, to meet all of our requirements before we uh, adopt the other two? But, but I don't care strongly. But that's why I said no. I couldn't quite hear, but I think you said you were w wondering if, if. If any of the adoptions, if any of the extensions would meet the criteria that we would put in those documents, is that what you had a little trouble hearing your audio? Maybe somebody else. Yeah, I think that's what he said. And uh, my answer would be the expiration extension. It's, it's, it's very simple. Um, it, 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 is, it is like basically an integer and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless he disagrees, like I, I, to me, that seems like the obvious candidate here. He wanted to like, you know, in the time remaining, because we were sort of had a schedule, see if there was any actual extensions that we knew of that would. It's not that we can keep this up. What? Okay, it's there. Okay. Never mind. Sorry, Nick. Okay. All right. Um... Ben, do you have any other uh, things or can we close this item on the agenda? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's all for me. All right. Um, anybody have anything else they would like to discuss related to privacy pass? <laughs> Uh, 
there's a little is there some we're good we're good okay then uh we can close the privacy pass meeting for this uh ietf thank you everyone